Well, welcome everyone. I am so excited uh, to be hosting this webinar in partnership with your coach. Uh, my name is Leanne Webster. I'm the executive director for the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. I um, have been with the organization since 2015, uh, since before we launched our first board certification exam. Um, we have a real thriving community of over 6,500 National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coaches. Uh, we've got another 1,000 that just sat for our latest exam. And um, we also have a, a community that wants to learn a lot about digital health. And so when Eugene reached out to me, I was all about doing this um, because we are receiving so many inquiries from our coaches. And um, I also have a lot of questions. So I'm very excited to be joined here with a, a very well-versed panelist. Um, Eugene, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Leanne. And we're super honored to co-host this with you. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've been building your coach for a number of years and truly believe in the power of health coaching. And it was built by, and, and, uh, by a health coach, uh, Marina, my wife, for the health coaches. Um, you know, a little bit of background in, in the digital health. Uh, so I've been um, probably going to age myself very quickly. I've been in digital health and health tech for close to 20 years now. Um, and, you know, I've uh, built businesses, operated, uh, scaled, and also on the investment side. Um, and today, you know, we're going to welcome an awesome panel um, from digital health companies. But, you know, before I welcome them to kind of the virtual stage, I wanted to maybe a little bit, you know, set the stage for digital health. I think, you know, we, we know that coaches, A, have their own practice and uh, work with their own clients. Health coaches work in health plans. Health coaches work with doctor's offices. Health coaches uh, work across the ecosystem, health and care. And today's focus is really in digital health. Um, it's really been a growing sub-industry, let's put it that way, with tremendous investments going into this industry. So last year alone, according to CB Insights, globally almost $60 billion went into this industry. Um, you know, I do want to acknowledge uh, quickly that, you know, as being in the health coaching industry, we've seen um, some, I'll call it unfortunate news as well um, in the industry, but we truly believe that health coaches are a key enabler, especially in digital health around behavior change. And so the future is bright for health coaches. And with that, I would love for our esteemed panel uh, to uh, join us here on the screen as we go through introductions. Perfect, welcome everyone. And um, we'll, we'll just go with quick introductions. And you know, while we have 55 minutes, we do want questions from you guys. So please, um, you know, the audience, um, you know, there's a lot of you, please put the questions in and we'll try to address as many as we can. And if not, we'll try to route those questions to, you know, the specific question for somebody on the panel um, afterwards. Uh, so obviously Leanne and I already did the intros. Uh, we'll go across how I see in the screen. So uh, Christine uh, Holbrook from AliveCore representing Heart Health. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks for having me today. So uh, I joined Alive Corps 15 months ago as vice president of coaching operations with a really unique opportunity to build the health coaching solution from the ground up. Um, some of you might have seen our press release that went out on May the 3rd announcing Cardia Complete. It's a comprehensive heart health solution focused on those with hypertension and arrhythmias such as uh, atrial fibrillation. And one last item, you see our device here. Uh, many of you may know us um, from our personal um, ECG devices, um, number one doctor recommended uh, one lead, six, week, six lead devices. So uh, excited to talk with you about today uh, about digital health and, and digital coaching. Yeah, and, and Christine, the first time you came on the screen, by the way, I thought it was your hand holding it, just F FYI, <laughs> just for a second there. So um, let's move on to Tiffany, please, um, and kind of representing, uh, you know, addiction treatments, and, and we'll dive into the leveraging of coaches in that field. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I saw some names I know that came up. Hey, everyone. I'm Tiffany Mattis, based out of um, Minneapolis. I work for Quit Genius, Director of Coaching Operations, been in the field a really, really long time, um, 22 years with health and wellness, and then specifically more on the coaching side for 12 years. 
And then our company really specializes in addictions. Um, we have tobacco, alcohol, and opioid. Just for clarification, our coaches handle the tobacco side, and we do have drug and alcohol counselors that work with the alcohol and opioid side. So definitely a different level of care. Um, but we really market ourselves as like the first digital clinic. Um, and then medication-assisted therapy is what we specialize in. So really um, working on the addiction side, and we're big on stigma. We like to get in there and really talk about how addiction affects um, employees and everyone around us. So that's our big thing. Hey, Amazing. everyone. Excellent. Maggie from Happify Health, uh, kind of covering some of the mental health and, and other components of this from that perspective. Please. Yeah. Thanks, Eugene. Hi, everyone. Great to see you all uh, here today. Um, I am the uh, medical affairs and coaching operations lead at Happify Health. I have been with the company for about a year and have helped to uh, build our live coaching offering uh, from uh, the ground up. And uh, I work closely um, with our team to um, build uh, and design coaching protocols that will uh, leverage, you know, self-help uh, resources and activities to, you know, help reach wellness goals. I am a um, cancer survivor. And when I completed my cancer treatment, I became a certified holistic cancer coach. So I also uh, work with cancer survivors and their caregivers uh, in their wellness journeys. Thank you, Maggie. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know metabolic health slash overall chronic disease management. Let's go to Devin from Amada. Yeah, thanks so much, Eugene, and uh, really excited to be here. So I am Devin Ellsworth. I'm uh, the Senior Director of Health Coaching at Omada Health. Uh, as Eugene was, was sort of alluding to, we, we serve members across uh, a variety of cardiometabolic conditions. So we started as a digital diabetes prevention program. Um, over the past couple of years, we've been expanding to cover uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes management, uh, hypertension management, uh, musculoskeletal conditions, and then we are integrating behavioral health support across all of our products as well, because we know that the comorbidities are, are, are such that you really have to treat the entire person. Um, so we're building a care model that puts uh, our health coaches right at the center, um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, we believe that behavior change is the treatment, you know, it is the medicine and coaches are experts in behavior change. So that's uh, why we are building that model. So I'm excited to be here today and join um, fellow leaders across the industry and have a great conversation. Welcome, Devin. And we're going to go to our own uh, Ashley from Your Coach. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ashley Honeycutt. I am the Director of Health Coaching Operations here at Your Coach. We're an end-to-end -end practice management platform and the only operating system for behavior change. We support the gig economy of health coaches. Um, personally, I started out as a teacher and turned homeschooling mom, turned health coach. Um, I'm also a nationally board certified health coach here in great company. I'm really excited to dig in today. There's so much we, we have to cover. So really ready to get into it. And without further ado, thank you for the introductions um, where, you know, I, we, we do get a lot of questions as well, you know, coming in, you know, what is the role of a coach, you know, with our industry partners, et cetera. And we'd love to kind of, you know, continue demystifying and we'll go uh, around a little bit the role of health coaching within your product uh, and or service, right? Because, um, you know, what I've observed, I guess, in the last decade is that race to automation. Uh, and we love to say that, you know, uh, today still human eye is better than AI in, in many cases. And, you know, if we look at kind of our, your coach itself, our logo is actually a hito which is a Japanese kanji for human being and that everybody needs a person to lean on. And what we're seeing as the trend is that while, you know, the uh, kind of the digital health and digital therapies been coming on market for a lot of self-paced tools, they absolutely work. There's science behind it, but there's some comes a time where you need a human being to help on that journey. So let's demystify this a little bit. I'll start with an A as in our life core, uh, Christine, and go to you as far as the role of the coaching. And also if you can comment uh, wherever it is a clinical service behind it, like a life core that you, know, you have also to clinicians, how that interface works as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. You know, human led, tech and tech supported for sure. So humans yeah. at the center um, always, 
you know, WOW Alive Core started with um, devices. You know, when you when you think about heart health coaching, um, which is how we refer to refer to our coaching team. You know, when you look at heart disease being the number one cause of death, and eighty percent of those cases being presentable, you just see the opportunity for health coaching being a, a vital part of the value proposition for our members. Um, certainly, um, we work as part of a care team um, comprised of clinicians. So we think of cardiologists, nurses, um, and what our coaches are doing is absolutely, we are fueled by AI powered connected devices. We are part of that care team, um, but our coaches are focused on helping members with those conditions with lifestyle modification. And I know we'll jump in that a little bit later, but for sure, human at the center. Good, and I'll go kind of this way. Um, Devin, uh, I think I'm just looking at the company list roughly. Omada has been there probably earlier on than almost any other company on the screen. Um, and I also know, you know, both Sean and Adrian as the co-founders from day one, if not earlier, believed in coaching mm -hmm. at the heart of this. So I would love to kind of hear your, your, your <laughs> leveraging yeah. of coaches. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, Amada, we've been, been at this since about 2011, uh, which is when we were founded uh, as a digital diabetes prevention program. And certainly in the DPP, there was a, a role for a human health coach and Sean and Adrian extended that to the digital environment. Uh, and, you know, over the years, I've been with Omada for seven years, I started as a health coach, uh, and have been, you know, um, leading our coaching organization for the past couple of years. Uh, I've certainly seen um, pressures towards automation, you know, looking for those opportunities to take the human out of the care. And uh, been really grateful and thankful that time and time again, you know, when we look at our data, we're able to demonstrate, you know, um, beyond even just sort of the the kind of emotional feeling or intuition that human health coaching matters, we're actually able to demonstrate that in the data itself. And so, um, you know, I, I, I would point towards uh, the Omada Insights Lab as a, a great example of that. This is a body of work that we've, you know, uh, uh, been leading internally for many years and, and about a year and a half ago, we, we lifted the curtain on the Omada Insights Lab and it's essentially our uh, uh, way of testing those care pathways. So we're able to kind of uh, to demonstrate, you know, if we're trying to drive a particular outcome, we can test uh, directly a human coach versus an automated nudge. And again, time and time again, we come back to the core insight that the human matters, right? The human has to be a part of the care. And our members tell us that in, in survey after survey, um, you know, we ask our members up front when they sign up for the program, what are they most excited about? And overwhelmingly, the majority are excited to have that human coach. Um, you know, and, and of course, this is backed by the, the scientific literature as well, right? Um, uh, relationships uh, matter for driving behavior change, not just that of a coach, but of peer support as well, which is also another component of our program. So, uh, you know, look to all of us across the industry as leaders to continue to tell that story and make sure that, that we are sharing what we are learning uh, about the impact of human health coaching uh, and that we're, we're able to see it as, you know, the critical driver of behavior change and not, not simply a, 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 a cost that needs to be managed, I guess. So. Yep. Or, or, or pure nudging. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll um, and next on my screen, I see Ashley, please. The, the role of health coaching in, in your company. Let's see. <laughs> I love it. So health coaches are front and center right there in our mission statement, right? So your coach wants to bring health coaching to the projected eight and a half billion people in the world by 2030. So it is front and center to everything that we do. Um, we do this by supporting health coaches, both with that end-to-end -end practice management platform to the coaching community, education and events. And then we take it one step further by also supporting and practicing health coachpreneurs on our platform with client opportunities through our industry partners. So we believe really strongly in the power of true health coaching. I know you guys alluded to that difference between, you know, getting in there and that human touch and coaching versus kind of the nudging. Uh, we really believe in that, that true health coaching and that's forged in the science-backed methodologies and the long-term relationships. And it's core to everything that we do. We have coaches on our platform that work across a, a vast, you know, wide span of different niches. And I just think that's really cool that we can come together because there's so many areas. I mean, just by the panel here, you can see all those places that health coaches can touch and lend their expertise to. 
Thank you, Ashley. Um, let's go to Tiffany again. Uh, Roll. I know you alluded in your introduction a little bit, but maybe dive a little bit deeper, peel the onion on on smoking cessation and and uh, the role of the health coaches uh, in there. Everyone said like pretty much summed it up. I don't know how much I have to add, but I really think coaching adds the personalization. You know, tobacco sensation's been around a long time. Um, it's true. It's tested. We use nicotine replacement therapy, but I think that coach provides that personalization that everyone needs. Um, and so the cookie cutter aspects of, you know, approaches is we can really personalize it to what people are looking for. Um, and so that's what I love about health coaching is people can feel heard and understood. Um, and I just can't imagine not having a program without the human side of a health coach coming in. Um, so ditto to what everyone else said, I don't have much to add. But um, yeah, I mean, that adds the personalization, the human touch that so many people are looking for and just validation, right? Being a human um, and really listening is important. So ditto for everyone, but yeah, just adding on to tobacco cessation. It's been around a long time. Yeah. Ma Maggie, let's go to you, please. Role of health coaching surrounding the digital self-paced therapies. Yeah, for sure. So, and uh, again, like Tiffany said, I agree with what everyone else has said uh, about the value of health coaching. And for us, um, we have, um, you know, we focus on wellness coaching and behavior change. And our intention with coaching is to help our users kind of leverage the um, activities um, and uh, solutions that we have um, in ha at Happify uh, to achieve their behavior goals. But sometimes you kind of need a little help from a person, from someone. And that's what, um, you know, why we've brought in coaching because uh, when someone does need a little bit of extra help, they can, you know, reach out to a coach. The coach is, you know, given, you know, a uh, information about that user, um, is able to engage with them, you know, uh, in a live uh, session and unlimited chatting. And so it gives them not only sort of that personalized uh, touch to the experience, but it also helps to build accountability and to um, sort of form that relationship that supports the individual and is encouraging and, you know, can guide them back to the tools um, you know, sort of putting the power back in the, in the uh, coaching use in the uh, user's hands, which is, you know, at the end of the day, we want to, you know, create these uh, ways to be self-sustaining with behavior change. Awesome. And I'm just seeing lots of questions around really uh, kind of the focus of this webinar um, is to really around, you know, what does it really take to, uh, to get a job at a digital health company? the skills uh, that are required, the, uh, you know, there was a question just scrolled off around, you know, why do certain coaching jobs require X, Y, Z certifications mm -hmm. uh, and backgrounds? So maybe, uh, you know, Maggie, we'll stick with you here and then I'll kind of keep, keep moving uh, around as we mm -hmm. watching the time. Yeah. So, um, well, with our coaching uh, offering, we do, um, you know, work with uh, national board, uh, you know, health and wellness coaches and, uh, and accredited coaches. Uh, we do feel that um, these individuals have had uh, amazing training and are, um, you know, uh, shown to be able to use the techniques that we're looking for um, to guide users towards behavior change. So, you know, it's important to us, for instance, that our coaches not only, you know, are fluent in like uh, motivational interviewing, some of those other techniques, but then also we um, look for coaches who are trained in mental health first aid, for instance, to be able to address uh, if a, um, you know, a, a a client is in, you know, risk of harm, either self from, you know, to themselves or from someone else. And then um, diversity, um, equity and inclusion, we, we want to be able to reach all of the different types of um, customers that we have. And so we want to be sensitive to the different needs that, you know, um, people bring to their coaching experience. Awesome, I'll just jump uh, a little bit around. Uh, let's go to Tiffany. 
It's like playing a roulette here, right? Yeah, yeah, it's frightening. <laughs> Not unpredictable. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, remind me one quick, the question was hiring from different backgrounds, right? Yeah, it, you know, the, I guess the overall topic, and I still see lots of questions around what does it take to get a job at a digital health gotcha. company, right? What are the backgrounds needed? Um, the certain skills that you guys look for, um, et cetera. All right, good questions. I'm probably the one on the side a little bit that we don't require um, anyone to be nationally board um, certified. To be a tobacco sensation coach, we can actually train you in house. And as long as you're UMass certified, um, it's fine. There are specific sometimes around undergrad and sometimes that can depend on your business model. We're B2B. So depending on our accounts and our contracts, we say we have a, a certain caliber of coaches. So yes, we often say that, um, we have a health and wellness background or a bachelor's degree, but I like to give back to the health coaching community. Um, so that's really big in the teams that I build. So I always say on my team, I want some senior coaches. I want some mid coaches. And I actually like to take some novice coaches. Um, somebody gave me that opportunity 12 years ago, took me in, uh, taught me to be a coach and look at me now. So it's really important that I do that with my team. And it also gives an opportunity for my mid level coaches and my senior coaches uh, to be the next managers right? They have to have an opportunity to uh, give back. So I love having that on a team. I don't like to have a team of full senior coaches. I like to have a mix. Um, and I think you have to have curiosity, number one, to be a great coach. I have met some Michael Jordan coaches that weren't certified, but they, they were invested in people and had such great curiosity. So I look for that. And I think the other thing with digital companies is it's a lot of startups. So I also want to make sure that they fit in startup cultures. It changes a lot. Can you be the jack of all trades? Can you handle working with product, with growth? Um, can you pivot? Can you build a plane as you're flying? So a lot of times too, when it comes to fit, it's come, it, it comes to, can you fit into a startup culture? It's crazy. But that's a big one too, for being successful in coaching. So once again, a little bit different tobacco, I, I can take on more novice coaches, but I do um, always have a certain percentage where I bring in people, um, maybe just out of college and we train them. That, that, that it's amazing. And actually, literally, as you were talking, Tiffany, there was a question just also scrolled off. Well, what if I'm a brand new coach, right? And I, you know, I haven't really coached in, in, in a while. And actually, um, we, we just recently um, announced an apprenticeship program with Dr. Sears Wellness. Um, as well. Um, and so these are the new coaches that are coming in, they would get assigned a mentor coach um, uh, to, to work with um, and consumers and customers. So um, something just to note. Um, let, let's jump to Devin. Um, same thing. I think, uh, again, just from sheer probably numbers and you've been around, um, you guys are like almost like a well-oiled machine, which takes finesse, right? As far as um, you know, who you select and how you select, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on there. Absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I'll, I'll probably find myself echoing a lot of the themes Tiffany just spoke to as well, actually. And I, I would say that, uh, you know, we, uh, have intentionally, uh, built a very diverse team. We, we see a lot of strength in diversity of background. We, we don't see any one background kind of being, uh, uniquely, you know, sort of positioning a coach to be successful. Same with tenure as well. You know, we do hire uh, coaches right out of college. We also hire folks who've been in the industry and, and have been coaching for many, many years. Um, uh, when, when you join Omada as a health coach, we also put you on to small teams uh, of, you know, with your peers and with a, a more veteran team lead health coach so that we can leverage those, those strengths, I guess, in diversity. Um, so, you know, we, we see lots of great coaches come who are board certified and, um, but we also see coaches who, uh, you know, are registered dietitians or, you know, uh, have a physical therapy or personal training background, um, or who have come from other coaching certification programs, or again, who are just straight out of college and looking for their first opportunity in digital health. Uh, and, um, so, you know, with our team structure and with that team lead as a mentor, uh, as well as our, our in-house training program, uh, you know, lots of opportunities to learn uh, really rapidly. Uh, I'm sure all, all, of, all the folks on the panel um, have their own platform as well, their own coaching platform. So we definitely look for coaches that are comfortable with technology, are excited about a tech-based solution, 
you know, and then um, also underscoring Tif Tiffany's point as well, you know, are comfortable with change um, because we are all still figuring this out, right? And we're all still figuring out, you know, what do our members need from, from us? What do did, what did our members need from our, our coaches? Uh, and how do we deliver that um, at scale to, again, the, the you know, um, shared mission of the 8.5 billion, I like that framing, um, you know, uh, I certainly share that mission as well, uh, that, that need our help. So, um, yeah, I would underscore kind of uh, a broad diversity of backgrounds, the opportunity to learn on the job, uh, really critical, and then uh, comfort with technology and, and, and being really flexible with change. Perfect, Devin. Thank you. Uh, um, Christine, we started with you on the last one, so I'm going to back right to Ashley. <laughs> uh, same, same question, and then we'll, we'll kind of uh, round it off with you, Christine. Perfect. Yeah. So at your coach, you know, we are the end to end practice management, right? So all it takes is someone who wants to be a health coach to get out there and who has that entrepreneurial spirit, who wants to have their own practice, you know, set their own time schedule, set their own rates, you know, set what their sessions are going to look like, what their niche is going to be someone who has that, that drive. So anyone can get on the platform and do that. And of course, you know, as we get into health coaching, there's certain skills that we know that help clients reach goals, right? That's what we've got. Um, all of these programs that are built, these NBHWC approved programs are aiming towards all the, the science-backed methodologies that we can use. And so as coaches practice on the platform and they're in there and they're helping their clients reach those goals and really displaying those skills, then they can become eligible for the client opportunities with our industry partners. And that's just a way for us to support this gig economy of health coaches coming up. Um, we're a company that's built by health coaches for health coaches, right? So we're just out there trying to support the community. And it can be either something that you do full time or something that you have a private practice on the side of your full time job, provided you don't have a non compete, right? I don't want to get in trouble with anybody here on the panel. Um, so definitely check on that. But um, we would love to have you on the platform. And I know there was a lot of questions on the side there about um, going through the programs, the education that's required. Just want to throw a quick plug out there that we did just launch our scholarship program for, um, for coaches that just finished at an MBHWC approved program and are going to be sitting for the exam. So it's a really neat scholarship that provides the exam prep materials and study sessions, as well as the exam fee. So if that's something that you're in a spot for, I would encourage you to check that out. Um, and as well, I'm really excited about this one. I can't contain it. Um, if you're interested in being a health coachpreneur, we're also going to be, for everybody that is here, dropping a code for one year free on our platform. So you can build your practice and accumulate. You can even use it to accumulate those coaching hours that you need to sit for the exam. So it's another way to support you in getting um, that credential. Sorry, I let yeah, that one slip. I couldn't keep it in. No, no, no. Uh, we're, we're we're okay. And, and I think one of one of the quick. I just want to um, just comment. The the scholarship is near and dear um, to our hearts. Uh, it was an honor of Marina's parents. Um, uh, so, um, and we've been seeing uh, an amazing, amazing set of applications it just just coming in daily. Um, so, you know, urge you, and I think Rebecca on our team will post uh, quite a lot of that. So, um, uh, Christine, let's go to you. Um, how? What do you look for at a life core in coaching? We're still in yeah, that question. I know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to go through what everyone already said, and I, I have to tell you, I will echo. I'll probably just add or. Um, uh, highlight a little bit of what Devin said, you know, and what Tiffany said as well, you know, being more of a, a with a startup, um, startups aren't really for everyone. Um, and that need to be flexible. We look for individuals that want to be really involved in creating the solution. You know, it is always about continuous improvement. It's about test, learn, apply. We think about that when we talk about coaching with our participants, but when you're actually talking about solution development, um, and we should always be continuously improving, not standing still. And so we look for folks that are about innovation, that they want to be involved, engaged in terms of what that looks like for our participants, constantly looking at research to help to figure out the best way to support our membership population. I mean, we're working with individuals at high risk, right? And so that um, ability, the comfort to be able to work closely in partnership with our clinicians um, to be able to understand how they work with patients, um, to be able to be a, a vital part of that care team is absolutely critical. And then, you know, to underscore 
comfort with technology. I mean, we're talking about digital health mm -hmm. and many of us probably started in the industry without a lot of technology to support us. And so how do you continue to, you know, upskill yourself um, to be exposed to different technologies? And there's a lot of information out there um, that can that you can see uh, and look outside of our own industry as well for what how others are using technology to support what they're trying to accomplish. And so sometimes those are the next ideas for our industry. So I would always recommend that. And so, you know, the other I would say nuance is for those of us where um, we do have access to remote monitoring data coming in from individuals, you know, that's a key part of when you think of digital health, is how do we um, improve access um, for participants? How do we um, increase quality? How do we get additional perspective and vantage points about our participants to help them to make more informed decisions about their care? Um, and so the key is, is how can we make sure that we are really using those technologies to understand as much as possible about those that we're serving? Um, to help them to make better informed choices as well. Love it. And I'm just going to bring something up because in, in many of our discussions, uh, especially around digital health and uh, and reimbursements in that digital health, remote patient monitoring, um, obviously there's lots of reimbursement components to this. Um, and, you know, if we talk about life sciences industry, again, um, you know, there's a conversation around adherence, right? And what um, I personally hate that term, um, you know, nobody wants to be told you're not adhering to something or compliant to something. Um, but this is where the beauty um, of health coaching, it's, you know, and I use an example of, God forbid, somebody with a stroke, their goal is could be only to walk two blocks, not to wear a device, but to be monitored, right? And so I think health coaches are able to turn that discussion into goal setting, and those goals will differ. And, and I think, you know, we have a representative from different companies across different sets of goals, but ultimately those goals tie back to that individual, right? I know I'm preaching to the choir of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of coaches uh, here, but I just wanted to comment because you brought up remote patient monitoring um, in there. So, you know, we talk kind of high level to a certain extent, uh, would love to get, you know, many coaches that are listening in, you know, what is really a day in life of a health coach and a digital health company? And, you know, I'm hoping we're going to see some level of differences just from an applicability of protocols um, and what that looks like. And, you know, I'll randomly pick um, Tiffany. Sorry, roulette is going that way. <laughs> All good. All good. So uh, day in the life course, all remote, right? So making sure everybody has a nice uh, work from home situation uh, and feels comfortable working remote. But really, I think with any digital, there's a lot of things going on at once, right? You usually have some kind of communication platform and the company uses Slack. Um, usually have your own dashboard that you have. And then oftentimes in early startups, let's be honest, you have spreadsheets because the dashboard isn't built to really do what you want it to do. So it, it's a little bit of that, right? Having your own book of business that you're keeping track of. Um, for us, we do calls and then most of it is digital, but we do do a phone call for everyone that comes in. Um, and then it's also dependent on what people want. Sometimes we get somebody that doesn't want to do a call. We do all digital. On the other side, especially with tobacco, we have different demographics, different social determinants of health. So we need to be able to actually have our program be all telephonic if we need it to be too. So we really need to put together a program that can look different. And once again, I talk about coaches pivoting. That's exactly what I mean. I, I need to have a coach that could maybe one time do it all digital, another one do it all telephonic, one do a, a combination of what the member needs because of the demographic that we work with. And then, you know, it's really a lot of times it's just self-motivated on the coach of, of how they break apart their day. I really lead by example in that if anyone knows me, I work out every day for two, for two hours and I block that in my schedule and I expect my coaches to do the exact same thing. Um, block that Google calendar, give that time to yourself, make sure that you're balancing everything. Um, so I really think if leaders do that, then, you know, coaches should well, they should just follow what they see. But um, yeah, I mean, meetings, I also put my coaches in front of product, in front of growth, in front of sales. I am the one that makes those connections. It's really important that the product understands what um, coaches have to deal with, what their barriers are. 
It's important that sales understand what a coach does. And it's important growth understands when they send out those emails, that's going to affect coaches and what that looks like. So I really do a good job of partnering all different departments um, with the coaching team. So that could be a part of a coach's day too, is meeting with product or meeting with growth or meeting with sales. Um, so that's big. Yeah, I think I put it all in. Yeah. I guess every day looks different. Yeah, it's startups, right? Yeah, exactly. We, uh, you know, the, the wind blows different way and uh, we got to do something else, right? Uh, just a yeah. little bit. Um, let, let's actually go to Christine uh, next. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because certainly coaching um, is the most important component of, of what we're doing. But when you think about the day in the life of, um, it's certainly preparing for your day, looking at your um, assigned members, looking at what happened um, with them from, you know, the, the past day, quite frankly. And so it's looking at what's been happening related to clinical or non-clinical escalations, who maybe they spoke with on the care team. Did they recently meet with one of the cardiologists and what's the post cardiology report? What's the recommendation related to health coaching for that individual? And then also after health coaching, what's the mechanism to make sure you're providing those inputs back um, to the rest of the care team? Um, it's preparing for those sessions. Um, of course, if it's a new member um, and other members, what, what sort of assessments, uh, how are they engaging um, within the member app, for example? Uh, what were the areas where were they all of a sudden increasing um, you know, blood pressure? recordings or taking more um, EKG readings. What's the reason for that? Sometimes those are what we really consider those early signals. And so what are the early signals that it's really important for the coach to be connecting with the member? Uh, when we talk about, it's like the moments that matter. Um, so it's not about a daily interaction for the sake of interaction. It's about an interaction when you get those signals that are going to be most important for the member and based on input from the member in terms of how they like to connect with you, when it's most important for them to connect with you, you know, when you think of what are those crucial moments for them, how can our coaches help them to create a plan in advance before those crucial moments actually happen as part of their life? Um, so, uh, so definitely, you know, when we're talking about building, um, there's that whole other aspect of um, being part of uh, conversations with UX, research, product, uh, you know, you name it uh, for sure, which that makes it a lot of fun. And, and I think that helps to bring additional diversity to the role and, and helping you to recognize that what you're doing um, is so absolutely vital, um, not only to the company, but to the individuals that you're actually, you know, partnering with as part of their coaching journey. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Let's go to Maggie, please. The day in life. Yes. So um, at Happify, um, our coaches, we work very closely, as um, you know, Tiffany and Christine said, with our product teams. And we are always, you know, looking at ways that we can um, identify opportunities uh, for co to mention coaching or to invite people into coaching. Um, so and, and ways to evolve what we have uh, to complement working with a live coach. So, um, you know, we're, we're involved in a lot of those um, discovery meetings. And as I said, we're just, we're still building it, right? We just started this about a year ago or so. So um, it's still very much an iterative process as well. So we are learning and evolving as we hear from customers uh, about our offering um, and ways to refine, refine our processes and our protocols. And um, so, you know, we spend a lot of time doing, you know, things like that, which um, actually is kind of exciting. I think it's a lot of fun, but we also work very closely with our sales team, helping them, um, you know, communicate what our um, coaching offering is and the value, um, the value prop along with that. And, um, you know, so we, we just are, you know, touch a lot of different areas with internally within Happify. Um, and it's, again, a startup, like some of you have already mentioned. So uh, you just never know. You, you, you just, you know, come in and uh, log in one morning and you might have some incredibly exciting uh, opportunity ahead of you. And it's, it's a really great environment. Awesome. Devin, thank you very much, Maggie. 
Mm -hmm. um, Devin, let, let's let's go to you again. You guys have invested quite a bit in, in coaching, and uh, I know uh, you know th there's quite a lot going on there as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, day in, the, day in the life of an Amada health coach, I think I would start with how, how we've broken down uh, the time that our coaches spend throughout a work week. And really 70% of uh, a coach's work week is dedicated directly to member care, which means that, you know, spending time in uh, our coaching platform, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, we've been been at this for about 11 years. And uh, in, in terms of product development, we, we certainly think of uh, having two user bases or two customer bases. We're obviously building, you know, product features directly for our members, but we also treat our coaches as end users of our product as well. And so, um, you know, we've we've developed our platform over the the, the years. Uh, to really optimize for data-driven signals uh, in a member's journey, uh, you know, surfacing key member moments uh, for our coaches, uh, and then uh, again, ultimately, the maintaining that that uh, autonomy for the coach to make that final decision about what does that member actually need based on what I know about this person. Uh, I have a set of you know data-driven signals about their recent engagement, but I know this person best and I know what, what they're dealing with in the moment. So I'm going to kind of, you know, use those signals to inform the care that I'm providing. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to craft the, the message and the outreach that is needed for, for that sp uh, specific member. Um, so much of the work week is really spent in direct member care. Uh, about 15% of, of coach time uh, is spent really just on, on admin tasks that we all have to do to, to you know, be good employees. And then the remaining 15% is what we call growth and engagement time for our coaches. So that's time spent with my, my team uh, where I'm learning from my peers. Uh, that's time spent in leadership opportunities. So you know, uh, serving on small committees or task forces to inform product development uh, or to inform new, new resource creation, uh, as well as time to go through new trainings uh, and then some self-directed learning as well. Um, you know, it's really important to support our coaches. Uh, I, I saw a comment in the chat about sort of the emotional uh, uh, toll or the emotional bandwidth that is required to be a care provider. Uh, and so that 15% of time that we, we carve out for growth and engagement is really targeted at that as well. You know, you can't do 40 hours of, of providing care. It's just not, not possible yep. uh, and sort of keep yourself healthy. So um, at the end of the day, we, we, we are really proud to make that investment in our team uh, as well. So that, that's uh, a little bit about how our coaches, you know, spend, spend their work week. Awesome. Uh, let's go to Ashley. And then we got one more key topic and I see lots of questions around this, uh, which I'll introduce after Ashley, please day in life. Well, that's totally up to you. You're the health coachpreneur. What do you want to your day to look like, right? And I think Devin's spoke to something really important about that balance. And Tiffany, I am in awe of your commitment. I think that's something, you know, we all strive for. And, but as that master of your own business, right, you get to decide what your day is going to look like. So at your coach, it's going to be obviously doing health coaching and all of those pieces that everybody here has spoke to. It could be um, if you're partnered with our industry partners, it could be reviewing those protocols, diving and seeing what new clients you have for the day, welcoming them, um, education and event opportunities that we do. You might participate in a focus group. We're always looking to level up our platform. So we collect that feedback from coaches. So maybe you participate in one of those, connecting with the community with mentorship or co-coaching, or maybe it's making sure you have time for that workout break or the ice cream break um, to beat the heat wave that's going around. It's really your choice. As long as we walk it off, I always joke around, you know, the yeah. ice cream. <laughs> um, you know, um, no, I appreciate it, Ashley. Thank you. And um, let's go, because uh, we want to leave at least some room um, uh, for at least a few questions here. But um, maybe let's just go around, because I see a lot of, lot of the questions around caseloads. Um, you know, we have coaches that work for large companies that... You know, um, we hear back, it's a little bit of a machine and then we want to practice our own and have the freedom. And so we're hearing quite a lot of that. And so we'd love to understand kind of the philosophy around, you know, uh, the burnout, potential burnout um, and how, how this is affecting. Because again, we talked about, you know, almost 60 billion last year, lots of high valuations, lots of expectations, lots of churn and throughput. Um, let's start with Tiffany again, uh, please. And then we'll go as quickly as we can just comment on that because lots of questions around it. 
man, putting on the spot again. Um, you know, I, I think I love when I meet other coaches that are now leaders because we really understand what it's like. We've hold, we've sorry, hold, we've held high caseloads. So I've been to a telephonic coach where I had 15 minute calls all day. I've worked at Omada. I've worked at Noom. And so my job is to really protect my coaches to a certain degree. And so what, what I mean by that is when, and sorry, my dog might bark here in a second, but um, when it comes into, hey, we need to improve our gross margin. I mean, that's my job to take a step back and actually look at what's time is being spent and also work at other departments, right? Is there something I can do in product to make our lives easier? Is there something from a cost perspective that we can play around with? So I really like when I meet other coach leaders because we get it. When our coaches come to us and say, I'm burning out, if you've been a coach, you understand that and you know how to pull back. I also am a very transparent leader. So I meet with all my coaches. I ask for feedback. I really have a good pulse on how they're feeling. And that's really, really big. But yeah, I'm so sorry. I knew it was going to happen. Work from home, right? I'm I'm just going to bring mine to counter that. So that's all good. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Anyway, so I think that's the number one thing is, you know, coach leaders that were coaches. We get it. We really, really do. Awesome. Uh, Christine, let's go to you, please. Yeah, sure thing. You know, based on my experience, it starts with workplace culture. Um, You know, you have to be so intentional about when you're hiring, bringing people on board, that they will help to maintain the culture that helps to protect our people. Um, And so, you know, it's like giving, encouraging, giving the license to unplug when we should be unplugging. Um, You know, there are constantly competing priorities, helping our people to understand not everything is the priority, but what are the main priorities to focus on? And when we talk about health coaching, that's pretty clear. Um, Helping to provide our people with productivity tools that actually drive productivity for them to help them to, you know, be their best at their role, not productivity for the sake of productivity, but to enhance, you know, how they're able to be the best coach they can possibly be. Um, And, you know, I think there should not be a fear about recalibrating. So, you know, sometimes there's a mod, there may be models that are built and, maybe it's the systems don't allow for recalibration. Like you have to be able to recalibrate to assure that when we think about workload and capacity, that it's the right blend, it's the right balance of those things. Um, And so for me, I think everybody in an organization plays a role in helping to assure that we recognize the early warning signs of burnout and that we actually involve ourselves um, to make sure that, you know, we protect our people. Um, so that would be my philosophy. Love it. Maggie. Yeah. So, um, again, uh, well, we're very conscious of, you know, life work balance, um, at our company. And so, um, that is, uh, just core to, you know, our operations. And so, you know, we provide opportunities for, Um, continuing education, we're, you know, supportive, we have career advancement opportunities. And then when it comes to um, being able to staff our coaching offering, um, you know, we work with our customers to understand, like, you know, what uh, the anticipated volume is going to be, and we keep a very close eye on um, what the what the flow is so that we can uh, ramp up accordingly in a way to manage the burden on the on the on the coaches. We never want um, you know any of our coaches to um, you know feel like they're they're being buried, right? So if they're reaching capacity, we want to then um, you know bring in additional uh, support to to grow um, you know to grow that out. So. Awesome. I thought your easy answer and a quick one would be, which I do use, uh, Happify. So oh, yeah, there's that too, know, of course. Re- re- relaxation <laughs> and burnout. So I wasn't uh, trying to, you know, but yeah. it does, it um, does. I understand. <laughs> uh, 
Devin and Ashley, and I think we're going to have, you know, only probably about seven, eight minutes just to answer at least a few questions. And I think there's a couple of trending for lack of a better term. So let's go to Devin uh, real quick and Ashley. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. I'll just echo a lot of what's been shared and, and share, you know, I think um, one to underscore Tiffany's point, uh, having coach leaders that have been coaches. So at Omada, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, we have a leadership team of about 12 uh, managers, uh, direct health coach managers and operations staff, and 11 of the 12 are former Omada health coaches. Uh, so we have health coaches designing the health coaching system and the role. <laughs> so we understand it. We've been there. Uh, and then again, just just uh, from that place, understanding and sharing that understanding with other leaders at the company to make sure that we're protecting the time. Um, it, it, it's it's a real thing, right? And so we as leaders have the responsibility to make sure that folks understand that when you are carrying the burden alongside your members that you are helping, that takes a toll. Uh, and so we need to create and protect time to care for the caregiver. Um, so it's a, yeah, uh, really important topic. Amazing. Absolutely. And I wish we had more time on this topic specifically. Ashley. I'll keep it brief, I promise. I echoing everything Tiffany and Devin said about having those health coaches at the forefront. Our CEO and founder, Marina, is a former health coach, right? So at the very top level, she gets it. We've got health coaches on staff as well, you know, including myself. Um, but I think even more than that, you know, if we dive past all of those pieces, coaches have to be 100% mentally, emotionally, physically present to do their work. And so it is in our best interest as a business as well to make sure that coaches are equipped to show up in that way. And all of the data that we have on health coaching requires us to show up as our best selves. So at the end of the day, if our health coaches are burnt out, then they're not happy, then our B2B industry partner customers won't be happy either. And so we have to make sure it rounds it out. We're all about building happy and healthy humans. And that can look different for everyone. We just wanna support our coaches and finding what that looks like for themselves so we can deliver the best product for everybody. Awesome. Um, with with that, that kind of completes our panel. And I think we can be doing this, uh, what I call Tim Ferriss style, right? A couple of hours turned into a podcast, but we'll stop here on this. Um, and with the seven minutes that we have left, and I've been just trying to, if, if you guys have been seeing my eyes kind of flip over to the chat, I've been trying to look at the some of the trends of the question. Um, the, it kept coming up over and over again and sort of ties into a little bit of the, um, you know, the, the burnout, but also, you know, things like caseload, chat versus video and the importance of 101 versus and versus group versus other things. So I'm not gonna pick on anyone who wants to kind of volunteer before being voluntold. <laughs> Anybody wants to mute themselves and talk about it? Or... Well, well, I will say Eugene, I think, I think if your um, coaching platform allows uh, we always talk about member directed, right? And to take that to heart. So I think it's really important as part of, you know, personalization, how does that coachy member participant, how we refer to our, our, the folks that we work with, how do they prefer to engage with us, right? Um, when and how? And so I think it's really important is if you have the flexibility to allow for those different kind of modalities, we should be able to, we, we need to assure that our coaches are familiar with, they're skilled at, they're comfortable with, and that's all part of hiring as well too. So, um, so it's where do we need to train up, um, but what are the skill sets that come to us um, for roles um, to again, give the member choice. Perfect, any other volunteers? Well, I saw, a question, I saw a question in there that talked about like video versus like text-based um, coaching interactions. And um, I love that question because that's something that, you know, we've thought about long and hard uh, uh, on our side of the uh, equation. And, um, you know, we try to offer a programmatic approach to our customers who engage in coaching. So, you know, we'll, um, as part of the um, engagement, they'll have like a 30 minute live um, audio video session a month. 
included, but they can opt for more if they need them. And then we have unlimited um, text-based um, chatting within our uh, solution uh, between the coach and the member. And, you know, the coaches are held to, you know, a reasonable response time, like within 24 hours. But we find that that is a good balance because it allows, you know, for that opportunity to connect and, uh, you know, um, see one another, but then also to continue the conversation and, you know, to, um, to work towards those goals. And of course, our platform supports goal tracking and rewards and things like that. Um, but um, it, we like the blend. Thank you. If any other volunteers, or should we try to uh, go to a couple of other questions that uh, we're just bubbling up? All right. Um, so again, uh, this one was all around, again, chat coaching versus phone. So I'm going to skip that one because we talked video. I know quite different, but uh, still. Um, one around kind of how many coaching sessions are done uh, in a typical day uh, in any of the places. So I think this touches on sort of caseload. Again, I know it probably varies, but if anybody wants to volunteer while I'm looking for the next question. I'll just say it really depends on your caseload, which sometimes yeah. depends on how far your product is, <laughs> which, right. It, yeah. You know, I, I bet if you talk to Devin, his caseload is going to look a lot different than when he came in to now. Same with Noom, same with us. So it can really, really depend on oftentimes in the startup of how built out your product is. And I think, you know, I think that's a great point, um, which what are the other technologies that you as a coach will be interfacing with? Um, and I think during an interview, right, during an interview process, unless you're building your own business, those are really important questions to ask, right? So what are all the tools to support me? Who else will I be working with as part of my team? Um, uh, what are expectations regarding communications? What is the expected caseload or the average caseload when I'm starting off with the company versus when I'm, I've gained my comfort level? So those are really vital questions to ask because if someone's used to a, a I'll say, you know, a lower caseload load versus a higher caseload, I mean, that's, it's vital for your fit. Um, to be asking those. They're not tough questions, but those are questions that you definitely want to put as part of the most important ones to ask my potential uh, employer. Um, another one that was there, thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, and I think probably the last one we'll take for now um, is uh, what opportunities are there for coaches who may not want full-time, but part-time or flexible hours? Um, I don't know who wants to volunteer. I, I'll just say that I think <laughs> contract i think a lot of companies are moving to flex and contract mm -hmm. it it adds flexibility in caseload size it adds with enrollment i really like to use contractors for people going on vacation um, i especially love to work with military wives that can't go full-time and they live in hawaii or some odd places and they can provide some digital backup so i really see it as a um and, and moms that are just busy with kids and want to work a little bit. So I also love giving that opportunity. So I do think that's going to be big and is flexing and contract work um, to back up your full-time employees. Yeah, Tiffany, that perfectly aligns with what I was going to say. And I know as a mom who was homeschooling, these opportunities would have been invaluable at that time, right? There just wasn't digital health, wasn't what it is now. But um, for those coaches who do want their own practice, you have that ability to set those hours and recognize that maybe when the kids are home in the summer, you're gonna scale back some because you're just busier. And then in those other seasons, you can scale up very easily. Mm -hmm. And with our industry partnerships, we can help you manage that and, and adjust when you need to. And I think that's just a really cool feature for anybody who needs that flexibility. Excellent. And look at the timing. We probably got like less than 60 <laughs> seconds left. Uh, there were so many other questions um, and we'll work uh, with the Leanne and Nicole and, and Katie and team to uh, try to sort of collect it, bucketize it and see how we can get back to the community here with some of the answers. Uh, look out probably for some kind of a blog, at least from us on, on summarizing this as well. Um, and, you know, again, Leanne and team, you know, super thankful and honored to be hosting this with you. Um, so thank you very much.
Yes, thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists and